All right, we're going to talk here about some orthopedic disorders of the pediatric leg and foot. We'll talk about genu valgum and genu verum. We'll also talk about Blount's disease, which is the most common cause of pathologic genu verum. And then we'll finish up with club foot. So a little bit of Latin, because as you probably recognized, those names are pretty foreign. So it helps to just memorize what the Latin words are for these particular parts of the body. So then uh, when, when you see the, uh, the answer choice on the USMLE, you know what it's referring to. So the Latin word for knee is genu, which we usually uh, pronounce in English genu, uh, which is coincidentally the same word for the French uh, word for knee. Talus is the ankle, and then pes is referring to the foot. So I don't, probably looks like I'm pointing the, to the toe there, but that's the whole foot is pes. So genu, talus, and pes. Valgum is an inward curvature uh, of uh, bones relative to one another. So when we're talking about the leg, if the legs curve in towards one another, it's valgum. And if they curve away from one another, it's verum. The way to remember this is verum, there's air in the middle. Valgum, there's not. You got space in the middle here when they curve away from each other. So genu valgum is knock knee. It can be unilateral or bilateral. It appears to be unilateral on this particular patient here. Now it's normal in children age two through six. So if you're talking about a preschool age child, this is not something that you need to worry about. And a lot of USMLE silhouettes are going to present to you patients who have genu valgum, but it's normal genu valgum because they're in a uh, phase of, uh, of growth where this can this happens normally and then it goes away as they continue to grow. However, if it's in older school age children or in adolescence, then it's always considered abnormal. So if you see this, and it should be pretty clinically apparent, uh, one way that you can test for it uh, in uh, as a f physical exam is to ask the patient to put their feet together. Normally, you should be able to touch your feet together. However, patients with genu valgum will not be able to touch their feet together because their knees will knock up before their feet can touch. So this particular uh, girl, it appears, uh, would not be able to put her feet together. Some of the causes can be vitamin D resistant rickets. It can also be idiopathic. So uh, as I mentioned for clinical, uh, for diagnosis, it's usually gonna be clinically apparent. However, however, you should get labs to check up for rickets and then get a leg x-ray, uh, which uh, should be obtained to document the severity. This is going to require a referral to an orthopedic surgeon who's going to need to do surgical correction because this is the only effective management for genu valgum. So here's a couple other genu valgum cases. This one obviously on the right, much more severe than the one on the left. So these patients have their knees as close as they, their legs as close as they can to each other and they can't get their feet together. Now there's ways that you can determine the severity. Uh, it's called the Q angle. It has to do with the anterior superior iliac spine and the top of the knee. You don't need to know that for the USMLE, but that's ways that the severity is technically determined. And then here's an x-ray. So the knees are knocked together. and I mean, anybody can knock their knees together, but uh, this is the patient is being asked to put their feet together as close as they can. Okay, genu verum is the opposite, and this is bow-leggedness, so the, uh, the legs curve apart from each other. And this can also be unilateral or bilateral. It's also normal in uh, children aged three to four, so this can also be a normal phase that the chi a child goes through. Not all of them, but some children uh, may go through a phase where they have uh, a little bit of genu verum. And uh, unlike genu valgum, this is more of a uh, restricted age period, usually only about age three to age four. Definitely after age four, uh, the child should not be in genu verum uh, anymore. So if it persists past age four, you should consider possible diagnoses. Uh, that's when we would consider it to be pathologic genu verum rather than just normal anatomic physiologic uh, genu verum. So some of the causes of genu verum include something called Blount's disease, which is an idiopathic 
uh, cause of genu verum, and it's the most common cause. And then rickets can also cause uh, genu verum as well. And particularly what we look for uh, with rickets is either a deficiency of vitamin D or calcium uh, or a, uh, a, a hypophosphatemic rickets, which is familial. So in this case, you should also get labs. Again, diagnosis, it's going to be clinically apparent. You will notice this. Parents will notice it. You'll notice it. These children do not appear like other normal children. Again, we're going to get a leg x-ray uh, to document severity. And you can also kind of check for rickets on the leg x-ray because you would note uh, a little bit of uh, bone demineralization. The treatment for genu verum is going to be the underlying cause, if indeed it is rickets. If it's hypophosphatemic rickets, you'd administer uh, oral phosphate. Um, as for other causes, it's generally going to require surgical management. So Blount's disease is the most common cause of pathologic genu varus. It's generally referred to as tibia varus because the actual pathology is actually in the tibia. So uh, this is a developmental disease involving disordered growth of the proximal tibia, and it presents as genu verum, but it persists past the normal physiologic period of genu verum, which is age three to four. So if you have a child that's older than age four that has genu verum, then uh, this is possibly Blount's disease. There's a preponderance of Blount's disease in African Americans as well as in obese children, so that's another thing to look out for, especially if you're working with uh, that population. Where I did my training, uh, there was a very high African American population, so I actually did see Blount's disease more than a few times. The history and symptoms with Blount's disease, obviously you're going to have a genu varus. Uh, it's important to differentiate out rickets, which is uh, another possible cause of pathologic genu varus. Uh, and then also uh, what you'll note on physical exam is an internal rotation and a leg length discrepancy. It should be shorter on the affected side. So the big thing is here, uh, just make sure you differentiate out rickets because rickets uh, is sort of the other very easily reversible uh, cause of uh, genu varus. And the treatment for Blount's disease is going to be uh, surgical and we do osteotomy. Okay, so here's Blount's disease. Again, this just looks like regular old tibia varus. Um, you can see here uh, you have a slightly more obese child. Uh, and you can see that the both legs, this, this is bilateral Blount's disease here, but what you can see here is uh, a little bit of internal rotation uh, of the foot, and that happens because of the uh, tibia discrepancies. And then here's another patient. Uh, this is a unilateral case. And then here's another one. Again, you can see some pretty significant internal rotation. So here's an x-ray. We've got a, a unilateral case here on the right and a bilateral case here on the left. Club foot. So this is another uh, congenital disease. Uh, this is also known as talipes equinovaris. And talipes is just a uh, conjunction of talus which is uh, ankle, and pace, which is foot. So it affects both the ankle and the foot. And then equinovarus, it comes from, uh, it, it basically is horse varus. And the reason is because uh, apparently the person who named this thought it resembled uh, a horse's foot, which it actually does in some ways. Um, so it's called equinovarus, uh, but this is just club foot. Uh, USMLE will usually put club foot in there for this one, uh, just because this is not a common word that's thrown around. If you read some of the older literature, it might say telepase equinovaris. So this is, as I mentioned, a congenital internal rotation of the foot and ankle. And this is a very common birth defect, so about one in a thousand. And there is a male preponderance of about two to one. There's an association with Edwards syndrome, which is a trisomy of chromosome 18, and with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, among other uh, diseases. So the 
symptoms, obviously this is going to be a very typical presentation. History-wise, uh, really there's, there's nothing because this you're going to notice at birth. So uh, actually some obstetricians can note it on ultrasound. So you'll, you'll just have your typical presentation, internal rotation of the foot at the ankle. It'll be easy to note at birth. It's a clinical diagnosis. You don't need to get any x-rays for this to make the diagnosis. It's going to be really obvious uh, when there's a club foot. And the treatment is pretty easy. It's going to be done by a specialist who will manually manipulate the foot and then cast it into uh, a uh, position and then gradually move, which will gradually move the foot into uh, the appropriate anatomical position. And this is really easy to do in, in young children. We start off really early, uh, and the reason is because the younger the child is, the more ligamentous laxity. Uh, the, the more uh, the more fluctuous and easy to manipulate uh, the the ligaments are. So the the older the patient gets, it's going to be harder to to uh, coerce the the feet into a normal anatomic position. So we want to start out, start out as early as possible. We usually start out at about two weeks, and this should correct by about one year of age. Now, cases that don't respond to therapy or cases where they didn't get therapy, they'll require surgical correction, and this should not be considered until after 9 to 12 months of age. So if they don't respond to therapy in the way that we want them to via the manual manipulation and casting, or if they did not get treatment early on, then surgical therapy is appropriate. But the initial therapy of choice is manual manipulation and casting. And here's a couple babies with uh, club foot. And you can see this is really, really, really obvious. And here's another one.